Tina from Garden District Bookshop. Uh, I am here this evening with Greg Mania and Juno Morrow. This is going to be such a fun event. I have been doing research about these two for the last couple of weeks, and I do know one thing, it is going to be entertaining. Um, Greg is a writer, comedian, screenwriter. Uh, his newest book, his first book, Memoir, Born to be Public, came out in August. It is hilarious. We sold our last one in the store today, but I do have these awesome book plates to show you. So if you order one from us, you will get one of these awesome book plates in your book. Um, and he is in conversation with Juno Morrow, who is an interdisciplinary artist and independent game designer, which I have to tell you got me big points with my son who is 13 when I explained who I was going to be talking to this evening. Um, her book, Marginalia, came out in June and I have book points for her book as well, which we also sold the last of yesterday, but we can order more. I will put the comments in the chat for you guys to order straight from the, the bookstore. And um, they will be talking this evening about Greg's book, Born to be Public. So I am going to back myself out right here and let you guys go. My, hold on, my Zoom cut out for like a second. What was the last five Mine seconds cut out too. of what you said? You're <laughs> awesome. And um, this is gonna be the best night ever. Oh, perfect. I mean, obviously. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for having us. Uh, you just made, I think both of our nights by telling us that our book sold out in New Orleans. So thank you. Um, so are, are we introducing ourselves? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we just got introduced, right? Yeah, oh, we did? I mean, okay, okay, right. I, yeah, 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 we did that. So should we, should I, okay, well, I don't know. I know a few people, but I don't know everyone. So should I do like a few minutes of reading? Like, should I just do like two, three minutes? I mean, do you want to? Yeah, let's, yeah, because sure, I don't know it. everyone here. I'm trying to sell this book, so why not? <laughs> okay, so I'll read the intro just so anyone who I'm not familiar with will sort of get the gist and what they're getting into. So I'll read the intro, it's called Introducing Prototype Greg Mania. Can you believe someone is paying me to write this 200,000 character tweet? I can't. I mean, as someone who tweeted, my kink is a lunch stipend earlier today, I find it hard to believe I'm employed, period. My profile picture on LinkedIn contained an exposed nipple for an entire year. I've posted a picture of me eating pizza on the toilet before. Shame, I don't know her. My social media presence has always been, well, let's go with eyebrow raising. If you're reading this book, you probably already know that because I've turned into a self filating promotional nightmare on social media and probably begged you 700 times to please buy a copy of this book from Garden District Bookshop. <laughs> 700 times because I guess I'm stuck doing this writing thing until I definitely die an early death from choking on a garlic knot. But that's not what I'm worried about. I worry about a lot of things. I wonder when karmic retribution will strike for that one time I ate a granola bar from a food drive donation bin. I replaced it, don't judge me. I was like on the verge of passing out. Uh, I wonder what would happen if my appendix spontaneously burst in the worst place possible, like a transatlantic flight. What if I've accidentally repeated a joke in this book? My head is a conveyor belt, turning out one worry after another. But deep down, my biggest worry is not being able to produce something of value. Sure, making someone laugh is valuable. I'm providing them a brief respite from whatever may be ailing them at the time. A chance to forget their troubles and throw their head back and laugh at a story about the time I took Ambien and bid on a 17th century chandelier on an online auction. I did not win that. Or the time I got vertigo at Home Depot. But what story can I tell that will inspire others to live their truth, all while laughing along the way to discover it? I'm inspired by those who have successfully cultivated their unique online personalities, the Rob Delaney's, the Megan Amram's, the so sad todays of the world, the ones whose voices capture the attention of millions on the internet and go on to shape popular culture through TV, movies, and books. I loved Catastrophe with Rob Delaney. I can watch an episode of The Good Place or Parks and Recreation and know which joke Megan Amram wrote. Melissa Broder's books are ones I revisit often. These are the people who made me want to become a comedy writer. I needed to follow in their footsteps, and I did. I created a character, an over-the-top extended version of myself I was able to develop a style and voice through, someone I was able to perform as. And I've never broke characters since, until now. All right, so I'll pause it there and leave the rest as a cliffhanger. 
So hi, Juno. Hey, so um, yeah, so you, you called us clashmates. So mm -hmm. It's very clever. A little pawn, a little pawn. So we both, uh, you know, we both signed the contract. Oh, this thing always falls out of my ear. We both signed the contract <laughs> to have our bush, uh, books published by uh, Clash and they both came out this summer. And yes. we both wrote memoirs. Yes. Which is funny. And they're both like, I mean, we have so much stuff in common. It's ridiculous. There's a like big we both overlap. went to we both live in New York, right? We both yep. wrote queer memoirs um, yep. with like trauma and like complex identity. Love it. Uh, we both went to the new school. Yes. Yeah. We wrote the same memoir. Yeah. We're, like... we're, we're basically the same person except totally <laughs> different, you know, like we're just like clones <laughs> with totally different yeah. DNA. They just replace the DNA with someone else's. Exactly. So yeah, I just I just finished your book um, yesterday actually. So I read it in two sittings. I read it like I read one uh, one half last week and I finished it yesterday. And uh, as as we discussed earlier, it was literally the funniest book that I have ever read. And I can honestly say that as someone who does not read many funny books. Um, maybe, I've read maybe one or two in the past, and I gotta say this one's the funniest. And um, but it's really funny. Like I actually like found myself laughing out loud and I don't feel like I normally do that with books. I don't, I don't know. I mean, is it normal to laugh during while reading a book? Yeah, I mean, well, I get it. Like sometimes I'll be reading a hilarious book, but it's like light internal laughter. So less LOL, more L-I-L, I guess. So I'll be like, it's authors like, I don't know, like Sloan Crosley is hilarious and I devour every Sloan Crosley book the second it comes out. But sometimes it's just like that witty sort of laughter, but it depends on the type of humor. So like Sam Irby's books, like have me laughing out loud, like Lindy West crying. Like it depends. David Sedaris, one of the funniest writers, you know, ever. I'll be like just chuckling to myself. So I don't know, it depends on, I guess, the writing, but it means a lot to me because I like to think of myself as this, you know, brazen, some would call me confessional, but I just like to, you know, I don't have a filter here. It just sort of goes out into the world. So it means a lot that you had like a, like animated reaction. Like that makes me really happy. Yeah, cause it's like, I know. remember- I Oh remember yeah, like, sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. I remember the first few drafts, like, I would give it to like my best friend to read or to my partner to read and I'll be like staring at them like why aren't you laughing like is it not funny and uh so it means a lot to you know hear that so thank you I appreciate it yeah um so it's yeah and, and when I first started reading the book I was actually reading it and you start off the book and this is this always happens when I read memoirs where you say that you like change the names of some important people and combine some people. And every time I read that, I'm like, shit, like, do like all my friends and family hate me? Because <laughs> I, I mean, did not do that. I mean, okay, so let's talk about the multimedia like similarities we have because I include pictures, but in terms of like identity, you have like receipts, like you have text threads in your book, like screenshots, like you and your dad talking, which. I mean, props to you. Like, I, if I did that, I would have a lot of people not talking to me. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I mean, please, but go on. It just reminded me of what you had in your book. Yeah, so I mean, and we, we both, um, so Greg has like uh, photos throughout his book and, uh, and I think they're very uh, helpful. I know there's one that's, uh, the one that stands out to me is the prom picture. So I wish we could see it somehow. Oh, that, yeah, can pull it up. Yeah, can we see that? Yeah. This was like a last minute add on because I was like, well, this has to be it. Okay, so this is, this is not me as like a 12 year old. Like I write about how I'm a late bloomer. Like I'm 18. I'm 18 years old in this picture. Like one eight, 18. Everyone's like, oh, that's such a cute middle school picture. I'm like, bitch, I was going to college in like four months. Um, Yeah, so thank you. That was like a last minute add on. I was like, that's a funny picture. I need to include it. I mean, it's it's more than funny. It's really telling because it really like shows your personality and like shows how you developed. Um, like I, I was very shocked to read that that like it's not like you're not using a pseudonym. That that's like Greg Mania is your actual yeah. name. Yeah. I definitely never expected that. I definitely expected it. You know, like that you decided like this describes your personality and like so like I don't know. Do you want to like talk about how you yeah. went from into like adopting this kind of 
persona or becoming mania? Yeah, totally. I mean, it was a total like persona from the beginning. Like, like you said, that's my real last name. Mania is, I believe it's a hybrid German Polish name, but yeah, just growing up, like we'd always get the condoms pronunciation at doctor's offices or what have you. And we'd always be like, no, no, it's Mania. Um, but eventually, like once I moved to New York and started going to college, uh, at Hofstra, which is like 20, literally 25, 30 minutes east of where we are in Brooklyn. Um, I just started st- uh, introducing myself to New York nightlife and I met people with really interesting monikers. Like there's my friend Breedlove and our friend Lady Starlight. And then, you know, it's just, and Darian Darling. I'm like, these, like, are these, they're stage names and I wanted that. And then like one day, you know, my friend at the time, I didn't know her. She was like, oh, are you that Greg Mania kid that added me on Facebook? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't bother correcting her. And, and ever since I just let that sort of be a persona and I just uh, inhabited because it allowed me space to like experiment with identity and bring out things that I was scared about bringing into the public like you know playing around with like gender expression and trying on different like gender bending like outfits and and presentations and flamboyant clothing so greg mania allowed me that space to do so and then as i started to grow up and i started writing this book after i graduated i sort of integrated those two um but for a long time yeah they were separate because i was like greg mania by night and then Greg Mania by day and and for a while it was pretty like black and white and then you know I started writing this and I realized that oh these facets can coexist together and you know we're many different things and that's sort of what the whole book became about. Yeah so it's it's interesting because like I was just like thinking about like so you were like actively involved in kind of like nightlife in New York and yeah. Uh, you've you've described yourself as a club kid Mm -hmm. and I always wondered what club kids do during the day because you know like when you go out at night to like one of these places and you see like just the very like loud outfits and like the crazy hair and just like the very like you know daring kind of like uh, I don't know this like game of escalation where people are like trying to outdo each other and trying to like feeling inspired and stuff and it's just like what do people do on the other days what do people do during the day yeah, I mean, a lot of people, that's their career. A lot of people, if you're like a nightlife promoter, that's what you do. You work Monday through like Thursday and then you take the weekend off because, and this may be a pejorative, but the bridge and tunnel crowd comes in like, and you get these Jersey people swarming like the Lower East Side and like acting a fool or like the Kitchen with Delphi will like be running amok in the Lower East Side. So a lot of these people, that's what they do. They host Monday through Thursday till four in the morning and they make good money doing so. Um, but for me, like I was a student. So like I would go out and like rage and like still somehow make it to an ADM class. Like that's just how I was able to operate for years. And some kids, like some friends of mine, just like they had like day jobs or they were students too. So you know, we were able to function like that. We were just able to like, you know, go hard until like four or five in the morning and then, you know, somehow get up the next day. Um, Yeah, so a lot of friends either worked, like that's the industry that they worked in full time or we just had to find a way to find that balance. But I mean, now like the entire like Magic Monday family that you read about, like we're all like retired (laughs) nightlife people (laughs) like we can't even fathom staying up past 10 like it's wild to me so yeah I mean now obviously we're all home now but I mean in recent years like a lot of those iconic New York City like downtown haunts they're not there anymore they're like TD banks and juice bars and a lot of the places that I used to hang out at they're just not there anymore so I don't know what the future holds for nightlife just because right now, obviously everything is, you know, we're quarantined until further notice, but yeah, it's, I wanted to just like capture this very special era um, with this book. And that's why there's the photo spread in the middle because I really just wanted it to be like immortalized. 
Yeah. So like, um, I think you also like touched on something in the book about how like this kind of like the social media culture of these mm -hmm. things. And like, I was just, it just actually reminded me of like, um, MySpace and like yeah. adding people, like making your MySpace page really crazy and like yeah. adding obnoxious music and like crazy colors. And then just like having like sort of a microcosm of like the kind of the nightclub scene as well, where you have the same kind of like people are, you know, using their pictures, their images, their presence to like cultivate like a persona or yeah. something. So yeah. that like really threw me back, like reading about that. And it was like, that's so weird because I don't do that anymore. Yeah. Like I to mean, think I about. Yeah, yeah, and it fascinates me because that's also the era, like you said, MySpace, which just beckons this confessional. I remember the bulletins that you'd answer surveys and like you would like put all of your information out there, like you everything. And then, you know, Facebook happened. And then this is also like the golden era of like Blogspot and WordPress. We were all like blogging and 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 it just sort of coincided with this, I, I would call it the tail end of like the golden age of my life, like, right? We had different eras. We had the 70s, we had Studio 54, the Warhol, 80s, 90s with the Mandalapore. And then, you know, you had the early 2010s where it was still this like sort of um, amalgam of all these different eras, but it was also coinciding with the heyday of social media. So this is really a time when nightlife and social media were like parallel to each other and um, that's, that's the era that I found myself um, carving a space for myself in New York. And I wanted to capture that in, in the book in terms of like the heyday of social media, but also this very beautiful, iconic, you know, New York spirit that, you know, is now unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's in the ether. It's, it's, I don't know what's gonna happen, but, you know, it, it, I just wanted it to be like something that I can look back to like, years down the line be like oh i used to be cool <laughs> yeah you you know you're you're growing up and all you do is look back on the past and think wow that was great so yeah. like you know you're growing as a person um yeah. so i think it was uh interesting that you're like that what you called like your claim to fame or whatever was your hair and how you had like you would spray paint stuff into your hair yeah i noticed that a lot of people have their like shtick like they had a thing like You'll see in the book, there's like reoccurring characters like Darian Darling is this like old Hollywood blonde, like bombshell. And then Breedlove is like this, he used to dress in like these sparkling sweaters and caftans and have this long like Jesus hair. And then my friend Brendan was known for like white sunglasses. So I was like, okay, I need a thing. Like, and I always loved giant blonde hair. Like I, I grew up watching Phyllis Diller on Hollywood Squares and I loved her persona. So I was like, okay, I want to have giant blonde hair, make it a mohawk and just spray the shit out of it with Aquanet. And then I was like, I saw, and again, this is like a Tumblr, which was also becoming like 2011, 2012, which is really like, I guess the most popular form of blogging. And I was very active on that. And I just saw like someone spray painted a word in their hair and I was like, oh, what if I elevated that? And I did like images, like commentary on like celebrity culture. So I started doing like portraits and, you know, there's Lindsay Lohan in the hair. So yeah, that sort of like became the way of how I carved my space in nightlife. Like I was that club kid with the stencils in his hair. And that was a way for me to like, again, that was a way for me to like claim my own identity and have my own thing. And in a way that was a very nascent lesson for me like if there isn't space for you you make your own so yeah that was like my foray into I guess you can say full-time club kid attire yeah so it's um it's interesting when you talk about like carving out space and you talk about like um you know sort of like cultivating a persona but also just like finding a space for self-expression right and and also with like you know like uh you talk about early on about like loving the color yellow and stuff. And you, like you had uh, dyed your hair like in middle school, was it middle school? Yeah, I started like, I was obsessed with those like herbal essence, like highlights. And do you remember that like inappropriate commercial where 
it was like a streaking party and like the dudes come up the stairs and like two like models open the door and the dudes are in like trench coats and they're like is this a streaking party and i'm like what is happening like what is my 10 year old 11 year old eyes like witnessing and it was like this like raunchy commercial and, like everyone's like like painting and highlights in each other's hair and i was like i want that so i like begged my mom to go to like the grocery store and get the like paint on highlights that everyone was doing and like what was it like 2003 2004 and like I just like went down the middle and had these painted like raccoon highlights like raccoon tail and they were obnoxious and I fucking love them um yeah but I started doing that in middle school that's when I started like experimenting with hair like hair as expression Mm -hmm. I was like oh I like changing my color I like changing the height and um yeah, but it was like herbal essences really like, kicked it off for me. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like almost you were like destined to kind of, you know, have this very like expressive personality because you talk about like your parents and how they were also like more expressive and they were into nightlife and all of these other things, right? Yeah, totally. Like they, I mean, they grew up like with conservative parents. I mean, they and then once they like I mean they grew up they were teenagers in the 60s so of course they were like running around like the discotecas in Poland and like my dad was a DJ my mom was like a stage manager <clears throat> pardon me for all these like nightlife acts and acts acts and jazz singers and performers so that was what they did for like 10 years and then in the 70s they came here to the U.S. and um <clears throat> you know, started a family, but they always sort of had this, like, club kid attitude where they wanted their kids to, like, self-express, and that's why they were very, like, um, welcoming of that, like, they encouraged it, so that's why my mom wasn't, like, oh, like, why would you want to dye your hair? She was, like, okay, like, let's try it with peroxide, see if you like that, so, like, in, in those, and, you know, in that capacity, they were very open to that sort of like exploration. Um, But again, there's also that whole like, you know, they're immigrants from Eastern Europe and they grew up during a certain time. So of course there's like, there's clashes here and there, but for the most part, I mean, they've always been very supportive and, you know, we may have not always understood each other, especially, you know, in my early twenties, but I mean, there's always been you know, just unconditional love. So I was very, you know, lucky in that regard. Yeah, I think it's really nice that you have like, I mean, I don't know. I just like when I think about like, I, I, you know, I talk about hair a lot. I'm like really obsessed with hair for some reason. I mean, um, I mean, just hair is great, right? Like it's, yeah. it's such an important part of like, um, you know, to allow you to like express yourself. And yeah. And I think it's really great that you had that kind of like supportive environment. I wish uh, wish I could have like done anything to my hair besides get it cut every two weeks, you know, like uh, so uh, it's, it's nice to be able to read about that. Cause I think it's also like kind of counter to maybe like some stereotypes about like Eastern European culture. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, that's just my parents were always like also very like my dad wore like jorts like ass grabbing like skinny denim shorts like denim vest with no shirts and i'm like like there's things going on there that i'm sure we'll get to talk about <laughs> and we still have yet to have that conversation but i'm like we, we need to examine some things but i mean that's why my parents were always like oh you want to wear like these tight skinny jeans from trash and vaudeville with like red leopard print down one leg sure like who doesn't? So uh, they were just very welcoming in that regard because that's what they were used to growing up. Like that European mod style in the 60s and 70s, especially in like like Germany, Poland, that was like very much in. So, and I remember my mom always told me like she would, when she first came to the US in like the late 70s, she would show up like in a look and people should be like she'll feel very uncomfortable especially walking down the street in new york city because that style didn't come here yet so she would come down like in a whole like i don't know velour number or whatever velvet number like a a fur vest like very kind of like share like bonnie like you know um 
and she would feel very like other because people would be like why are you dressed like that so I mean I guess that she also just like much understood that whole outsider being in so yeah I, I guess I sort of adopted that attitude for my mom as well yeah so um I think one of the things that I, I don't know why this is surprising, um, but I found it surprising that you you talk about like suffering from depression, anxiety, panic attacks. And I think it's like maybe because, you know, my first impression of you um, via social media was just that you're like very, very confident because you seem so like bold in your self-expression. Um, and so for some reason, although I, I feel like I should know this by now, it's it surprised me that um that you have that kind of anxiety in you and that you've had like a lot of trouble with like the panic attacks yeah like when you were growing up yeah. so like what kind of what kind of things would trigger that uh yeah i mean i've had my first panic attack at 13 and i mean what triggered it was uh in fourth it was the fourth grade i went to this like age and appropriate haunted house like the school got in trouble for it but i remember like I passed out. I was so scared. Like they had, it was like a Halloween party and they turned around the classrooms into a like haunted house. And there was a line to go in there and <clears throat> I was doing it because all my friends were doing it. And I want to go in and like get spooked with them. But like one kid threw up, I passed out like people, like it was bad and parents got like pissed off or whatever. And I was like thoroughly traumatized by that. So for me, that sort of triggered these series of phobias that I had so like in fourth grade my phobia was like tornadoes like and this is central Jersey like a tornado is like maybe occurs once every 20 years like almost never right and I every day I'll see a dark cloud in the sky and I'll be like I'm not going to school like I can't like there's gonna be a tornado because that whole um that trigger that maladaptive chemical response in your brain that tells you that danger has passed and it's like your coast is clear I didn't have that so that's basically what irrational fears and OCD in that regard does is you have a response in your brain that tells you okay the coast is clear you're safe when you're growing up or when you are diagnosed with that type of OCD um, you don't have that response that tells you the coast is clear so like everything was like danger looked around every corner and I just I was that around the time that Twister came out? When did Twister come out again? That was like... 1999, maybe? Okay, yeah, that was around the time. I didn't see that movie because my parents didn't let me watch Twister uh, because of that phobia. I, I, I have seen it and I love that film, but <clears throat> when it came out, my parents were like, you can't watch that film. Um, Probably for the best. Yeah, and then, but then as I grew up, like, so did these irrational fears. So then in middle school, I didn't have a fear of tornadoes. And actually a tornado literally touched down like in eighth grade. It literally formed like right over our middle school. And, but we didn't see it. Like we just heard it in the window, but like that didn't scare me. I was then scared of like my parents dying, like in a, like anything, like anytime they left the house, I'm like, something's going to happen to them. And like, I, I was like paralyzed by it. Like I, they didn't want to go out to dinner. They didn't want to go see their friends because I would have, a panic attack and then that went away in high school and then like the fear started to change and now I just have like a generalized anxiety panic whatever um but it like grew up as I as I grew up like they evolved as I grew up and now they're more existential like I'll stay up and like just think about death um other cheerful topics so topic like, yeah exactly so it's things that are like now as an adult like just like generalized anxiety. I don't have those irrational phobias anymore, but they did like evolve as I grew up. And uh, I had my, yeah, like you said, I, I started getting panic attacks at like 13 and uh, I didn't get one again until I was like 19, which is when I got formally diagnosed with panic disorder. But of course now, like I've finally found, at the time I found a therapist that we just clicked and, you know, it's like dating, you got to find the right, therapist for your you know it's it's a connection that you gotta just feel on a visceral level and I was able to develop the appropriate coping skills so and I didn't really have that as a kid growing up because every time 
my parents took me to a therapist it just like it amplified the otherness that I was already feeling like being feminine and gay and and just like already bullied for a slew of other things like I didn't want kids to learn that I was like seeing a shrink because again that's stigmatized like I was that's something I learned was like oh that's something trouble people do and I'm doing that so I hated therapy as a kid because I just would end up crying because I didn't want to confront my problems but as an adult I'm like uh, can we do twice a week? Will my insurance cover that? Because that's great. Um, but yeah, that's something that I just had to learn uh, growing up. Yeah. And I think that that's like, I don't know. I, I feel like that, like if you didn't have that anxiety and depression and like the panic attacks, you know, and the bullying and all these negative things, like, I don't know if you would be you, right? right. Like so much of your like comedy comes from you know anxiety. this kind of perspective and anxiety and like <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. you've developed coping mechanisms and i think a lot of those are you know how you express yourself through comedy yeah. through style yeah through stuff that, like that and that's something i also want to write about was just like for a long time i didn't want to like it's like coming out again like i just recently came out as someone suffering with chronic pain like and that another thing was like, I was scared to come out because I, I didn't want people to be like, oh, you should get a new office chair. I'm like, no, like fucker, like my spine is on fire, not because of my posture, but because of like the way trauma lives in my body and <clears throat> writing this book and like embracing mental illness as yet another facet of who I am was a, was a way for me to like reconcile that. Like I, this book is just ultimately about the totality of identity and embracing each facet and mental illness is just one that happens to be a part of mine. So I, I, I can't not write about it because it's, it, it influences the arc of the entire book. Yeah. I think it's like, it's so, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, maybe like, maybe I'm, and I, I I've called myself this like an emotional masochist a little bit where mm -hmm. it's like you kind of, you, you find so much inspiration and like you find you develop these coping mechanisms which are like turn into creative work or like self-expression or whatever and right. so like you almost like that's like desirable in a way to like see how much you can grow and see how much you can reflect upon it and see how much it affected you and maybe this is also like an extension of narcissism um so like because uh, i know you said that you thrive on negativity <laughs> yeah that, is that I, related yeah i mean like i listen my partner gave me a um like a a notebook or like a like a planner and he was like oh there's positive affirmations in there sorry babe and i was like i was like looking through i was like how many like i remember i had a roommate like she had like these positive effort like you know act like a proton think positive and i'm like i'm gonna burn this apartment down like for me i get it i listen i would love to be positive i just i, I don't have the time yeah. Um, and I think that's like, you know, I don't know, your, your personality is just like so essential. And I, maybe that's why it connected to me as someone who is like sort of, uh, I don't know about a negative person, but right. I, I like thinking about the darkness. You know, I like thinking yeah, about yeah. all of the, the awful things. I'm going to dwell on it. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, I'm bitter. And that's honestly, it's fuel. It's like stronger than any like cold where you can have revenge yeah. and happiness. Red Bull, Red Bull, who, no, like I'm, I thrive on that. Yeah. It's if like can, your brain always going to the worst possible place. Yeah. And that's that's people, something you can turn into something else. And people who are like, I don't want to be around complainers. I'm like, why not? Like that is so much fun. Like you sit around and you just go for it. Ugh, it's like a book club, but fun. Not that book clubs I, aren't fun. I love a book my, club. My book club is fun, but they right. passed uh, on my book. They didn't want to read my book. I don't know, maybe because I'm in the book what? club. Yeah. What? It was like, yeah, my partner suggested, oh, we should read Juno's book. And then no one responded. And it's like, oh, great. No, I will start a book club. And by the way, I'm going to get on follow for that. Book clubs are totally fun. I just happen to think complaining is, I mean, it's, 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 it's either an acquired taste or I just think everyone should try it. Don't knock it until you try it. Like, Anyway, please. I'm going to interject something really quickly here. Our book club complains all the time. <gasps> See, I don't that's know. my type of book club. Our book club is really close. A lot of us have been meeting for a long time. And yeah, we're just like, tell me you hated this. 
please someone else tell me you hated this did you hate this one okay good and then like as soon as enough people in the group go yeah yeah i did then it's just like a free-for-all see hatred is the connective tissue of our society but like not in an awful xenophobic like trumpy way like in a fun like communal like we all you know what i mean please vote it's a means of connecting, um, but not in the bad way, not in the bad way. Exactly. It's like in a fun, like, lovey, like, let's hate the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel like the best thing about a book club is, uh, or the best book club is the one that stays together. Like, I feel like it's so hard to keep a book club together. Yeah. Like most book clubs just, they, they last like one book and then everyone like, and then let's start another one. Let's do another one. That's and then problem. no one reads the next book or like one person shows up and it's you and you're like, no one else read the book. That's probably why I don't have a great history because like I would start a book club and I'd be so excited but then like one by one people would fall off. And then like I, I just I guess again like you want to find a sense of community with people and what's a better community builder than negativity. Um, <laughs> but no I think I just need to find, again I need to just find the right book club because I love talking about books and but you're actually you're invited to mine we're both in New York. You <laughs> Yes. it's a queer book club you're welcome to come oh beautiful i'm i'm so there i'm so absolutely there yeah um so let's see i had some stuff i want to talk about i guess uh so like uh so much of your book is about new york and mm -hmm. like you know we both live in new york as we've talked about and new yorkers love talking about new york they never stop talking about new york <laughs> especially so, leaving like, it oh yeah people love leaving it like you said the most new york thing you could do is move to la um so like do you think that like that you would exist if new york wasn't here if you weren't in new york like do you feel like that's something fundamental about you at this point that you've like your formative yeah. experiences happened here absolutely i don't think i would be like who i am without not just so much new york but like the community that i found like at that specific time of my life like how magical it is that i was able to be under the same roof of all these people and it's bittersweet for me because like I look through, you know, the faces in here and I'm like, oh, she lives in London now. She's in LA. They're in, in Oslo, or wherever anyone is. And I don't know if we're ever going to be under the same roof again, but these are the people that like changed my life. Like they literally ushered out the person that I was always sort of shy to like bring out and like make public. And uh, they were my teachers, they were my friends, and they were my teachers, and they were my, you know, cohorts, and yeah, I, I wouldn't be who I am today without them, um, so yeah, to answer your question, like, I definitely, like, New York is so much a part of me that, I mean, it runs through my blood no matter where I go, so. Like, little New Yorks come out when you're bleeding? Exactly, yeah, like, little, like, used needles just, like, come out. Like, if someone stabs you, it's, like, 50 <laughs> New Yorks come out? Yeah, exactly, yeah, like, little pieces of, like, bagel and, like, overpriced, you know, I don't know, lattes, cold brew. Ugh. I hate mess. it. I it's a mess. It. Don't, don't, don't stab Greg. I know. Um, <laughs> I know. I, so I think that, like, for me, and I, if, if, if anyone's ever heard me talk about New York, I, I love talking about New York. Oh, and yeah. I think that one of the things about New York is that it's, like, there are so many people here who are so, so many people come from so many other places and they're often like the best people at what they do. They're like the most like intense or like they're the hardest working or like they're the most colorful or right. like, you know, so many different like kind of superlative uh, kind of people coming here. And I feel like it kind of like whatever you're doing, whatever you're into, if you're into like, you know, like fashion, self-expression and nightlife, or if you're, um, you know, a writer, or if you're like any, whatever you're into, you're an artist, right? It's gonna like step up your game because you're gonna like feel that like you're in what is this called? Like the small fish in a big pond, big fish yeah. in a small pond. You're like a fish in a big ass pond with like big ass fish, right? Yeah, yeah, and like exactly. you're like, shit, I gotta be a big ass fish too. Or yeah. you move to Oslo, you know? Or you move to yeah, exactly. And yeah, I mean, totally, there's this drive that like, is like very visceral when you come here because everyone is just so and a lot of it is like posturing like we're all like trying to like showcase the best version of ourselves and like everyone's fabulous but again it's like once you meet the humans and like their vulnerabilities and you get to know these people it's like you're together for life but I guess like you said New York is very cutthroat and and it takes a lot of 
you know, gumption and, and drive to survive because everything is exorbitant and awful and overpriced and everything's a nightmare, but, but there's, you know, there's magic here. And I think everyone's searching for that, like that high that you get when you like have that first glimmer of being like, Oh, I can make it here. Oh, I almost quoted that Frank Sinatra. I almost um, want a positive affirmation and you know I will break out in hives. Well, uh, well, we'll be waiting for them. Get okay. to uh, get your Ben and Roll ready. Okay. <laughs> you know I do. Okay. So um, you you talk about dating in New York City. So oh. like, what are your, and, and you have like a whole chapter devoted to like dating tips. And then you have a second chapter about dating separately, like right after. So, oh yeah, like, breaking up. Yeah, how to date and then how to break up immediately. <laughs> So like, I don't know, it, do you really think that dating is different in New York than other places? I, I mean, I, just because I feel like, especially in the city, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with our attention spans and we're like, on to, I mean, we walk fast, we talk fast, we're like super like one thing after another. <clears throat> and I feel like dating is that way too. And I, I satirize that because, you know, the, the, the men that I would like go out with, like would lose interest after like 12 seconds. Like the person that, inspire that chapter like 10 tips like modern day in New York City he was like I thought it went perfectly and then like after the date was like so perfect and then he texted me and he was like oh I don't think we're compatible compatible astrologically um see you around though and I'm like I like slapped it like we like had a thing and like we would talk for months and months and then like he would just like, he just blew me off for like this, whatever reason. And I was just like, well, this is such a New York moment for me. And I just turned into this whole like satirical thing because all the guys that I've been with in New York, I mean, excluding my partner now, we've been together for like three plus years and, and it's like lightning in a bottle for me to meet them. But like previously with my relationships, they were so like, they were sad. I mean, like they were like, they would either ghost me or like they would like there's one guy oh my god like like I was obsessed with and like we wanted these amazing dates and one day he's like so my fiance's flying in from London and I'm like what <laughs> like fiance and I think they got married because he wanted a green card but I'm not saying that but whatever anyway I digress so yeah it was just like so many instances where it was just like these shitty dudes were like I don't know it was just one dude after another and then I found Pete and everything was rainbows and perfect but yeah it was just like one one dud after another and I was like I'm tired of this I'm just gonna turn this into you know comedy and get some cats so but you know i have a partner now i'm very happy no cats yet. No cats oh. but soon well i'm not coming over um <laughs> don't you have a cat i have a cat yeah but you okay. can never have too many cats right is that how that works no. that's a, that's how you get a problem right when you like, when you have no, that attitude it's the wrong attitude no they're like chips you just keep getting them i mean i'm i, I really want a dog right now that's what i'm on i mean i love i love cats dogs all, I mean, all fuzzy animals Absolutely. They're all my friends. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you talk about, I don't know, we're like at 747. Should we keep going or? Yes, yeah, someone asked a really great question. Has writing a memoir changed the way you look at what you do in the present? Like, do you I think I should slash shouldn't do this in case there's a memoir part two? That's a, uh, I know some writers like go seek experiences to like get material and but that depends like if you're like writing a journal like a journalistic memoir or like a, like a reporting like a reporting reportage reported memoir let's go with reported memoir like Emma Eisenberg wrote the third rainbow girl and it's like a true crime memoir so it's like a memoir hybrid slash investigative journalism book and um you know, that's something she had to research and she had to go to Appalachia and do interviews and put herself in those situations with these uh, key figures in this case. 
But in terms of like my life experiences, like I'm not a writer personally that goes and seeks experiences just to write about them. I just sort of churn whatever comes my way into, I guess, material. But that is something I do, like something happens to me and I just have a visceral reaction to like, I'll, I'll metabolize it as humor. I'm like, okay, something good or bad happened to me. How can I laugh about it? How can I make someone else laugh about it? So I will say it's like an opposite thing. Like something will happen to me and I will try to like angle it in a way that's funny or relatable or what have you. But um, I just sort of let, you know, I just let what happen happen and then um, see if I can like pan for gold in that. I guess panning for gold. I feel like that's like a big thing with memoir. And yeah. like, I mean, for, for me, I think it was just like, you know, trying to really focus on like certain aspects of like my personal experience um, and like thinking about like, you know, what, what kinds of things I include, are they like how relevant they are? And then um, you ended up with something like very focused. Mm -hmm. And I think that if, um, and that leaves a lot of space. So like, um, you know, I'm already thinking about the next one. I, I know you are yeah. as well. You're already, you're already working on something else. Um, oh, hold my hair, yeah help so there's like lots of space to like keep going with this even though like what's 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 the what's the topic of the next one what are you gonna talk about it's sort of a continuation of i mean the issues that i like started to write about and born to be public which is about it's gonna to me about like medical trauma like diagnoses in the past few years so like it starts where born to be public left off and sort of is a snap it's gonna be essays and it's gonna be a snapshot of my life from 25 to now I'm gonna be 30 next year and these five years have just been you know they haven't been easy um a lot of shit went down and a lot of it transpired in terms of like chronic pain and and getting these uh diagnoses that were concerning and then um Again, it's just a lot of medical trauma. And I really want to talk about like all of that because I feel like chronic pain is something that we're just now starting to bring into like um, the conversation in, in terms of health and, and wellness. And a lot of times it's something that's so like nefarious in terms of how to diagnose it. And I just want to write about that in my experience, like um, uh, living with it because it's something that I just recently like posted about and uh, it's been something I've been grappling with and it's been really hard and, and trying to like live with all this trauma physically. And now I'm like ready to like write about it. Like I wasn't ready maybe like a year or two ago, but now I'm like, okay, like I have a point of view now that I can share and, you know, make relatable. And of course, garnished with all the negativity that you could ever want. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. I think it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 all about like channeling all the suffering, you know. Yes. Like absolutely. like you know, uh, boiling it down to the essence, and then and then you can just like hand it out, and people can yeah. drink it, and then they can feel good. Yeah, right? exactly. It's like this. That's the thing about writing with mental health. It's like I'm not. I don't want it to be prescriptive. Like, there's no happy ending. But like, here are things that I do that maybe you can like cherry pick for yourself, and like we can just sort of commiserate together and just be like there's no we don't have to like find a solution we can just coexist and like sit with it for a minute we're not like you know finding solutions or um you know getting cured like that's not what it's about like that's what this next book is it's just finding ways of accepting these things that are hard to accept and just living with them and just sitting with it for a second being like okay like I have this in my life that I need to find shelf space for like then that's what that is really it's finding a place to put these things that are hard to accept in your life but they're not going anywhere and you just got to find a space for them like on in your mental bookshelves or what have you I love a metaphor love a good metaphor um <laughs> so I think that like you know a lot of what yeah I so I, I, th I think I said that like, you know, my first impression of you was that you were like super confident in your bold style and everything. And like my, my feeling was that like, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to like connect to him and his story. And I 
feel like that was obviously wrong. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, we had, we have so much in common, but also like, it's amazing how you can like universalize experience, how like your personal experiences, like, and when you like are vulnerable like this, when you, uh, as you said, like drop the persona yeah. um, and just talk frankly, like everyone can see like the human side of you and they can relate, you know, they start to right. think about the things that have happened in their lives and how they affected them. And so I think it's really valuable, like it's a valuable contribution um, and it's entertaining. So it's, it's nice to be able to have both where you're like thinking through um, how this relates to you. You're learning a little bit. And like, you know, we talked about like thinking back on like kind of like MySpace, Facebook, like adding people and like kind of all of that stuff. So it gives you space to like reflect on your own life, reflect yeah. on, you know, um, all kinds of things. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really valuable and it's a really great book. Um, Thank you. And that's, and that's why I was excited to be paired with you because I, like, I was like, why did I agree to do this? Because Juno was so smart and I'm like a blubbering idiot. Cause your book, like, I love that the overlap between our two bodies of work, even though they're like very different, they're also very similar in terms of like trying to like be okay with the messiness of identity like it's frenetic it's it's always changing and like you're in the margins or you're not and like people try to put borders around identity but sometimes those borders don't fit or they don't exist for us and that's something I want to like illustrate with this book and you do it so beautifully and so eloquently that that's I was just really excited to talk to you about that because I think we had that really great overlap and you know, there's a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences, but that's that very fine equilibrium that, you know, when you hit it just right, it's magic. Yeah, the intersection. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, of course. Yeah, I don't know. Um, buy Greg's book. Uh, buy a book. Um, Garden <laughs> District Bookshop. Even though right? we're both sold out, Garden District, like, bestsellers, that makes me so happy. They're gonna um, order more. There are more coming. Can't there are definitely more coming um, and I will put the links to both Greg and Juno's books in the chat one more time here yes we have the signed book plates I will show those again I have them and like now like this is why like we encourage people to order from and garden it's ships right you can order it and it will absolutely yeah so if you can order your book get gifts and start your holiday shopping now because booksellers when no end of november december comes it's get start ordering your books now for your friends and family your frenemies yes thank you for mentioning that i really appreciate it shipping <laughs> is taking longer this year it's just a fact it's taking longer to get to us it's taking longer to get to you so, so it feels like october is you know christmas is so far away but start your um, shopping it, now It'll be here before you know it. Be kind to your booksellers. They are probably processing orders themselves. There's a lot coming in. Be patient. Get your gifts now. And then, yeah, spread right. the love. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much, Greg and Juno, both for doing the Zoom event with us and sharing your book and listening to your conversation it has been <laughs> the least sucky thing I did today. How about that for a positive statement? Yeah, I think I agree. Like this was, I was I like the tinge of negativity. Right. I mean, you know what? I'm trying, I'm trying here. I'm doing my job and also sticking with the vibe. I'm here to just like down. bring it out out of you. I'm like the little, I'm the devil on your shoulder basically. And I'm, I'm happy to fill that position. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, Juno. I really appreciate it. I'm a giant fan of yours. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm a fan of yours. And thank you everyone for joining us. This was so much fun. And I hope everyone takes care and hangs in there as well as, well as you can. Hi, Alex. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. And also Stephanie Castro is one of our like New York City nightlife veterans. So hi, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. St. Jerome fam here. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for coming. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Be well. Take care.